Firma Transceptor Technology. Hello, the world. Internet. Jason Isaacs. <laughs> snap my god that takes me back um anyway we are here to talk about the general structures written into the constitution by which we reify or give shape or form to the uh, principles that we've already discussed i think at great length and we're going to start off with the separation of powers um you'll remember that's one of four structures one of four means uh, to achieving those constitutional ends and um, so, yeah, let's talk about the separation of powers. Thank you, Snap. We'll kill that. Now, uh, Madison said, uh, writing in the Federalist hundreds of years ago, that the accumulation of all powers, legislative, executive, and judiciary in the same hands may just be pronounced the very definition of tyranny. And a word that's going to help you in this is autocracy. Uh, autocracy, as it says there, is a system of government, blah, 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 well, as I say from time to time, you can read, so you can read that. Now, that's one of those technical phrases that just makes life so much easier, particularly when you're talking about the separation of powers, because obviously if the separation of powers is about separating power and autocracy is about centralizing power, then we can use one, I think, uh, to explain the other. So here's Madison again. What he's essentially saying there is he's giving you a definition not just of tyranny, but of autocracy, when all of those powers are combined together and one man can essentially rule by himself. So if we bring all of those powers together by um, extension, by splitting them up, we should be able to prevent uh, autocracy or by disrupting autocracy, we can disrupt or we can prevent tyranny. That's the idea. If we can disrupt autocracy, then tyranny essentially becomes uh, impossible. So we separate our powers to break up autocracy and thereby uh, to prevent the, um, the possibility uh, of tyranny establishing itself. And we separate our powers thus. We have, uh, as we have discussed in the past, I think, our legal triangle, where we have the executive that executes the law, the judiciary that arbitrates the law, but first and foremost, we've essentially got the legislature, and they create the law. They are the first article in the Constitution, you'll remember, because this is what the Founding Fathers thought was going to be the most important aspect uh, of the Constitution. So we have those three branches of government and uh, we've divided power across them. And then in addition to that, we create the system of checks and balances, whereby the judiciary, uh, they check the executive and the judiciary and the legislature and the legislature checks the ex executive. And we can turn those around and the executive checks the judiciary and the executive checks the legislature and the, and the legislature checks the judiciary. But of course, what we'll find as we go on is that those particular powers there, the ability of anybody to uh, check the judiciary is profoundly limited. And this gives way to, um, well, it enables the judiciary to move from the independence of the judiciary to judicial rule to the imperial judiciary. But I'm running ahead of myself, uh, unless, of course, you're coming back and looking at this for revision purposes, in which case you'll be looking at this and saying, well, what the hell is he doing there? And uh, you'd be absolutely right. So uh, anyway, we'll worry about that uh, another time. So the question is, if we've devolved or if we've disrupted autocracy by separating our powers, how on earth are we supposed to get things done? Well, as in all things, America, the only way you're ever going to suppose or the only way you were supposed to get anything done was uh, through cooperation by bringing all of these branches together and achieving consensus. So if we can achieve consensus between the courts, the executive and the legislature, then we can get things done. Uh, but as you all know, uh, the chances of achieving that are minimal. And when one branch is not talking to another, when one branch is refusing to make concessions and achieve compromise and cooperate and coordinate their efforts, then what you wind up with is gridlock. And this happens when we have a highly partisan and polarized uh, political structure. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, right there. But when these guys refuse to compromise, then we have gridlock. It's not necessarily a recipe for gridlock. We only find gridlock when we cannot achieve consensus. And if we've got very partisan politics, very polarized politics, and we've got different uh, groups in control of each of these branches, then that is exactly what you are going to have. And that's pretty much 
uh, what we've got at the moment. Let's just dig a little deeper into the idea of the separation of powers because this probably as far as I'm going to get in this particular presentation and it is something that is worthy of detail uh, analysis. So the general idea behind the separation of powers is that a power divided is a power contained and this arrives from Montesquieu. He was a French political theorist and uh, he argued that we have these three branches of power and um, if we can separate these, if we can take power and break it up, then we disrupt autocracy and thereby uh, prevent tyranny. Uh, we need to go a little bit further and explain exactly how that is applied in the case of the United States. And there are four ways in which it's applied. First of all, differentiation. We, we identify and distribute power. We say, yeah, you over there, you're the legislature and you have that power. And the executive, you have that power. And the judiciary, you have that power. That's essentially the, the application of Montesquieu's theory. We then have incompatibility, and we say that if you're a member of one branch, then you can't be a member of the other branch. Now, you'll know from your studies in British politics that this simply doesn't apply. In the United Kingdom, you can't be a member of the executive unless you're a member of the legislature. And until very recently, we had the Lord Chancellor, who was just, he had a foot in every single camp. So in the UK, we don't have this incompatibility uh, of office. In fact, it's an obligation. One of the principles of parliamentary government is that government must be drawn from Parliament. In the United States, on the other hand, we have that separation of powers, and it says that you cannot be a member of more than one branch at any given time. And we can see that when uh, Obama had to resign his Senate seat to go and take his place uh, in the uh, executive. And um, Pence had to resign his seat uh, in Congress to take his vice presidential seat. We also have this little thing called delegata, potestas non potestat delegari. Now this was presented to me by my uh, tutor when I was back at university and it basically says uh, if you are the legislature you can't hand your um, you can't hand your power on to your um, to another branch. So the executive can't turn around to the legislature and say oh well you can't be bothered you exec you uh, execute this legislature for me. And similarly, the legislature can't turn around and say to the executive, well, hang on, you can do this for me. Now, the problem here essentially in the United States is that we have got the judges who in addition to being imperial, keep being asked political questions. They keep being asked to arbitrate in matters of politics rather than matters of law. And as a consequence, we could argue that they are violating uh, the separation of powers but we're going way deep into canon here so we should probably just retract we're going into the weeds and instead we're just going to look at the third bit fourth bit sorry and we're going to look at checks and balances and this is the idea again memorably put by uh, madison that ambition should be made to counter ambition and that i sort of touched on earlier but we're going to look into it in a bit more detail uh, now if we look at the executive we can see he has a series of specific powers there and uh, in addition to that he has uh, specific checks, checks on Congress and those rather ineffective uh, checks on the judiciary. Again, he can appoint the judiciary, but there's nothing he can do after the event. If the judiciary hands down the judgment, there's nothing he can do uh, to do uh, to, to challenge that. Uh, the legislature, on the other hand, they have formal checks on the executive and the judiciary, and of course they have their own set of domestic and foreign powers, and you can read all of those there. Now, the judiciary constitutional amendment the key thing there is that the constitutional amendment can only be initiated by Congress. They can't unilaterally change the Constitution. And again, with impeachment, there's very, very special conditions applied to the impeachment of judges. It's again high crimes and misdemeanors, as with the president. And uh, as a consequence of that, we find that the, legis the Congress cannot do anything again to challenge a judicial decision. I don't want to get into that right now because we go into it in a great deal of detail and depth later. But essentially, once that Supreme Court has made a decision, there are only three things that anyone can do about it. Uh, the first thing you can do is just uh, accept it, sit and wait, and then maybe try again when the balance of the court changes. Or you can try to amend the Constitution, uh, but that's incredibly difficult. And the last time the Constitution was amendment, amended in response to a Supreme Court decision was 1913. Or you can try to legislate through the gaps, and essentially that's where we are now. And you can see that with uh, abortion in the United States. The Supreme Court established uh, the right of a woman to have an abortion, and since then Congress and indeed the state uh, legislatures have tried to legislate through uh, that or around that particular decision uh, with varying levels of success, I think would be fair to say. 
The judiciary then, uh, these are its specific powers and those are its, uh, its checks on the other branches. It doesn't look very much on paper, but it does effectively make it the most powerful branch because there is nothing that either the executive or the legislature can do unilaterally, certainly, to challenge uh, a judicial decision. Um, so if we separate power, as we discussed earlier, if we separate power and we have those checks and balances, in order to get anything done, we need consensus, we need agreement between the three branches. And that was designed to ensure that anything that the state did was fit and proper. In other words, the state should only really get involved when it was entirely right uh, that it should do so. Uh, but of course, that has somewhat been uh, hijacked by the principle uh, or by partisan politics and by a highly polarized political system. And as a result, we have uh, that gridlock uh, coming through. I just want to have another look at checks and balances before we finish. This is that idea of ambition being made to counter ambition. Here are our three branches, the judiciary, uh, the executive and the legislature. And uh, the executive can exercise veto over Congress. It can, under certain circumstances, adjourn Congress. Congress, on the other hand, uh, can reject appointments. Uh, you can read, I'm pretty sure. Um, so if we go through all of this, it all makes uh, some sort of sense, I hope. And uh, when we work all the way through it, uh, we, fun we come to the end, uh, to this particular slide, which I'm getting to, and it should be popping up just about now. There we go. Um, this is the separation of powers, checks and balances. Uh, as laid out on one page. And uh, again, you can either find that on the internet or I can get a copy of that to you. I do want to stress that the judiciary gets off very lightly from this system of checks and balances. Uh, they are independent. You can't have uh, the rule of law essentially without uh, an independent judiciary. So it follows that they should be outside the system of checks and balances. Uh, the process of judicial review itself is extra constitutional. So again, there's nothing in the constitution that says judges should exercise judicial review from which it follows inevitably that there's nothing in the constitution that allows anybody to do anything about that exercise of judicial review. Um, and that gives rise to this idea of the imperial judiciary and that then gives rise to the idea of politicians in robes or judicial rule. Right, that's that for the time being. Uh, we're going to move on to federalism, rights and democracy in the next presentation. I know that I've gone through that very, very quickly. Uh, but I hope that everything is clear. I'm sure if it's not, you'll come and find me, and uh, I will see you then. Look forward to it. Speak to you soon.